Hello everyone. Welcome to Mathematics, Physics, Mathematical Physics channel. Today, we present another episode from the Physics Puzzle series. This is Physics Puzzle number 5, and we're going to talk about symmetric electrical circuits. If you are new to the channel, make sure to subscribe and turn on the notification bell, so you won't miss future episodes. Keep in mind that the aim of this channel is to represent the beauty of mathematics and physics, and the pure connection between them. So, watch other videos on our channel, and support us with your comments and suggestions. Now, let's begin delving into the puzzle. Today's puzzle is about a famous symmetric electrical circuit. In the given circuit, we shall find currents I1 and I2 shown by the red color. In general, symmetric electrical circuits may be seen a lot in physics olympiads. So, by solving this puzzle, we learn how to analyze any symmetric circuit, and how to take advantage of symmetry to make our lives much easier. Please give yourself a few minutes to solve this problem. After a short pause, we're going to solve it together. First of all, we need to understand that what symmetry means in physics, and how we can identify it. Generally speaking, Symmetry is an unchanging feature in something with respect to a measure. For example, in mathematics, we say that a sphere has symmetry over the azimuthal angle. This means that a sphere remains unchanged by the rotation or spinning about any diametrical axis that passes through the center of the sphere. So, a sphere is a symmetric geometrical object with respect to rotation over its diametrical axis. There is a simpler way to comprehend this symmetry which by the way helps us very much in order to understand symmetry in physics problems. First, we choose a diametrical axis, and put an observer on any arbitrary point on the surface of the sphere. Then, imagine that the observer keeps his or her position fixed unless changes the athomethyl position. So, the observer spins around the axis on a fixed orbit. However, while spinning, he or she feels no difference between his or her right hand side and left hand side, or likewise, between his or her top side and bottom side. This means that the geometrical environment remains the same for an observer walking through the fixed azimuthal orbits about the symmetry axis. As an example of symmetry in physics, consider the two-dimensional electric field line of an electron. An electron has the charge of negative E, and by Coulomb's law, we can easily write its electrostatic field. We can represent this vector field on a two-dimensional plane. Now, we can write the electrostatic potential resulted from an electron. We realize that the formula for the potential is only dependent on the magnitude of the distance of the observation point from the electron. So, if we sketch a circle centered at the position of the electron with a radius of this distance, all points on the circle feel the same potential. Thus, we say that this problem or this potential has radial or circular symmetry such that an observer feels no potential difference as long as he or she stays on the same circle because has the same distance from the source of the potential. Very good. After this rather long and detailed elaboration on the symmetry, we go back to our electrical circuit puzzle. The first thing we need to do is to identify the symmetry and type of it. Clearly, if we have the circuit by a vertical line passing through the center of the circuit, we realize that everything on the left side exists on the right side as well. It means that if we fold the circuit from the symmetry axis, the left and right sides coincide exactly. Be cautious about the horizontal line passing through the center of the circuit. This line is not an axis of symmetry for the circuit since on top of it we have a voltage source of, V1, and a resistor of, R1, and under the line, we have a voltage source of, V2, and a resistor of, R2. V1, and, V2, are not necessarily equal. R1, and, R2, are not necessarily equal to. So, the circuit is not symmetric with respect to the horizontal line. Now that we've identified the vertical line as the symmetry axis of the circuit, we can say that if an observer walks through the symmetry axis and looks at his or her left or right side, he or she cannot spot any difference. Therefore, we conclude that any corresponding physics-related quantities should have the same value on either side. What do I mean by that? Let's dig it deeper. I name the nodes on the symmetry axis by, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Also, on the right, I name the nodes as, G, and H. Now, on the left side, I name the corresponding node of node G by G prime, and the corresponding node of H by H prime. The symmetry of the circuit requires that the voltage of node G is equal to the voltage of node G prime, and the voltage of node H is equal to the voltage of node H prime. 
Similarly, again by symmetry, the current running through the branch AH is equal to the current running through the branch AH prime. Moreover, the currents into branches GH and G prime H prime are equal, and the currents passing through FH and F prime H prime are equal too. Now, we apply KCL to the nodes and determine the currents passing through every branch. This is very simple. We start by writing KCL for node A. Current I1 is incoming toward node A, and two equal currents are leaving the node. So, each branch takes half of I1. We can easily do this for node C, since the current I1 is leaving the node, the two incoming currents should be half of I1. We continue playing with KCL. Current I2 is pumping the bottom node, node F, and so, each outgoing branch takes half of I2. Also, each of the two incoming currents towards node D should be half of I2 since the current I2 is leaving the node. On the rightmost node, node H, half of I1 and half of I2 is incoming towards the node, so, I1 plus I2, divided by 2, is leaving the node. You may want to check the KCL for node G. We see that half of, I1 plus I2, is pumping node G, and half of I1 is going towards node C, and half of I2 is leaving towards D. So, everything matches perfectly. The remaining currents on the left part of the circuit can be completed by symmetry. That's perfect. We've found all the currents running through branches in terms of only two unknowns, I1 and I2. Now, we should note that since we have two unknown variables, we need to find two independent equations. So, in order to find currents I1 and I2, we have to apply KVL to two independent loops. By independent loops, I mean we shouldn't write KVL for the same symmetric loops on the left and right sides. Thus, we choose one loop from the top half and one loop from the bottom half of the circuit. For example, these two loops give the same equation, so we cannot utilize them to find two independent unknown variables. Similarly, this pair of loops, and also, this pair of loops do not give a set of two independent equations. On the other hand, we can use this pair of loops since they give two independent equations for I1 and I2. In addition, this pair as well as this pair, or even this pair of loops work too. Very well. We choose these two loops to apply KVL. As emphasized in previous electrical circuit puzzles, in order to apply KCL to any node or apply KVL to any loop, we need to assign a sign convention. Please find the link for the physics puzzle series down in the description, and have a look at the previous physics puzzles, particularly, physics puzzles number 3 and 4, where I've talked about the sign choice in great detail. So, we start writing KVL for the top one. We start from an initial point and circle around to finish at the same point. We, arbitrarily, Set the sign convention such that for voltage sources, whenever we pass from the positive end to the negative end, we get A plus sign, and for resistors, whenever we pass according to the current direction we get A plus sign. Based on what said, for the top loop, we write, R multiplied by, half I1, plus, R multiplied by, I1 plus I2, divided by 2, plus, R multiplied by, half I1, plus, R1, multiplied by, I1 minus v1 equal to 0 we do the same process for the bottom loop we get r multiplied by half i2 plus r multiplied by i1 plus i2 divided by 2 plus r multiplied by half i2 plus r2 multiplied by i2 minus v2 equal to 0 so far so good we got the two equations that we required. Now, we shall solve this system of equations for I1 and I2. But before that, let's a little simplify these equations by collecting the terms with I1 and the terms with I2, separately. So, for the first equation, we get, I1, multiplied by, 3 R halves plus R1, plus, I2, multiplied by, R half, equal to V1. And, for the second equation, we get, I1, multiplied by, R half, plus, I2, multiplied by, 3 R halves plus R2, equal to V2. Now, we multiply the first equation by, 3 R halves plus R2, divided by, R half. Then, subtract the second equation from it. We end up with this, where the term with I2 has gone away, and the new equation only contains one unknown which is I1. Finally, if we divide both sides of this new equation by this big coefficient of I1 inside the bracket, we obtain I1. After simplification, 
This is the result for I1. We can do the same process for the second equation and calculate I2. However, there is a trick here that we can use to obtain I2 without any further calculation. If we look closely at the circuit, we can spot another symmetry. And, that is when we interchange or swap V1 with V2, I1 with I2, and R1 with R2, there is no difference in the circuit. It's like we rotate the circuit 180 degrees about the central point of the circuit to left or right. This symmetry can also be seen in the set of two equations for I1 and I2. If we interchange or swap the subscript 1 and subscript 2 in the first equation, we get exactly the second equation, and vice versa, if we swap subscripts 1 and 2 in the second equation, we get exactly the first equation. This is actually a manifestation of the beauty of the pure connection between mathematics and physics. We can observe and interpret physical intuitions or physical facts through mathematics, and mathematical intuitions or mathematical facts through physics. I love it. I hope you too. Now, in order to obtain the solution for I2, we only need to copy the solution for I1, and then swap the subscripts 1 and 2. There it is. Perfect. We learned how to analyze this symmetric circuit and solve for the unknown currents I1 and I2. However, this is not the only way we can handle this circuit. There is actually an alternative approach that we can employ to simplify symmetric circuits and analyze them. Remember that we mentioned that once we found an axis of symmetry for a symmetric circuit, we can claim that all the corresponding nodes on different sides of the symmetry axis have the same voltages, and all the corresponding branches on different sides of the symmetry axis have the same currents. So, in our case, we can say that the voltage of node G is equal to the voltage of node G prime. Thus, they can be connected together or short-circuited. Likewise, we can say that the voltage of node H is equal to the voltage of node H prime. Thus, they can be connected together or short-circuited. Basically, if we fold the circuit from its symmetry axis, corresponding nodes with the same voltage will be put on top of each other. But, what happens to the circuit's elements particularly resistors? Obviously, everything on the symmetry axis remains unchanged since all the nodes on the symmetry axis remain unchanged by this folding transition of the circuit. So, V1, R1, I1, V2, R2, and I2 have the same values as before. On the other hand, when node H is short-circuited with node H', prime, then the resistor between node A and H will be parallelized with the resistor between node A and H'. Prime. So then, we have two R resistors which are parallel connected. Knowing that the resultant resistor of two parallel resistors with the same value is a resistor with half of the value, we replace these two parallel R resistors with R half resistor. The same story is true for all the R resistors. So, we replace all of them with R half resistors. Now, as you can see, the circuit is simplified and we shall solve this simple circuit for I1 and I2. Let's do it then. On the top part of the circuit, we have the V1 voltage source which is in series connection with three resistors. Two R half resistors and the R1 resistor are in series connection. The resultant resistor of series connected resistors is the sum of all of them. So, for the top part, we get a R plus R1 resistor, connected to the V1 voltage source. We do similar process for the bottom part of the circuit. We get a R plus R2 resistor, connected to the V2 voltage source. In the middle we get the same R half resistor. Obviously, the node G or G prime, and also the node H or H prime can be spotted on this simplified circuit. The current I1 is the current running through the top branch passing the voltage source V1, and the current I2 is the current running through the bottom branch passing the voltage source V2. Now, this quirk it is very simplified and very easy to solve. You may use any method to solve it, but here, I use the mesh analysis method. There are two meshes here. Obviously, by these choices of directions for the mesh currents, the current of the first mesh is I1, and the current of the second mesh is I2. The current through the shared branch between the two meshes, I mean the middle R half resistor, is I1 plus I2. Now, for each mesh we write KVL by moving in the direction of the mesh's current. KVL for the first mesh gives negative V1 plus I1 multiplied by R plus R1 plus I1 plus I2 multiplied by 
R half equal to zero. Likewise, KVL for the second mesh gives negative V2 plus I2 multiplied by R plus R2 plus I1 plus I2 multiplied by R half equal to zero. If we take V1 and V2 to the right hand side of the first and second equations, respectively, of course by the change of their sign, and if in each equation we collect and separate the coefficients for I1 and I2, we realize that this set of two equations is exactly the same as the set of equations that we obtained for I1 and I2 in the previous approach. Besides, we can easily notice that by the interchange or swap of the subscripts 1 and 2 in these two equations, equation 1 transforms into equation 2 and vice versa. So, everything is exactly like before, and also the physics and math match perfectly. Therefore, the set of solutions for I1 and I2 is the same as before. That was quite an interesting and exciting puzzle to solve. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to subscribe and turn on the notification bell, so you won't miss future episodes. Keep in mind that the aim of this channel is to represent the beauty of mathematics and physics, and the pure connection between them. So, watch other videos on our channel, and support us with your comments and suggestions. See you next time.